So, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Yes. Um, and part of that call in, in the Greek is really rethink, like re change the way you look at things. And so, to show the relevance of tonight's topic, raise your hand if you think prayer is very important in your spiritual life. Okay, great. Keep it raised if you wish you prayed more in your life. Okay, perfect. So you see how relevant tonight's topic is. And a lot of times that comes from, I just need to be more disciplined or I need to try harder. But sometimes it's, I need to rethink and look at how, what is a prayer life to begin with. And so tonight we have two panelists that can really help us think about this again. To my left, Mrs. Mary Rose Verrett from the mountains of Virginia. Mm. Originally. All, originally, <laughs> all the way to Brobridge where she's married to Ryan, uh, who's Ooh, standing man. over there with, with my elder little baby. And... Um, her and her husband, Ryan, founded Witness to Love, which is a marriage preparation and enrichment ministry that's touched the lives of people from Canada to the Philippines to even places like San Francisco, right? So uh, we're blessed to have them tonight. Ms. Mary Rose Verrett. Thank you. And to her left, Father Michael Champagne, a member of the Community of Jesus Crucified from the metropolis of Leonville. I'm going to put a billboard of you. Uh, Grand village. Grand village. Um, and of course, he needs very little introduction. Father has traveled the world speaking about our topic tonight. So welcome, Father Michael Schoenfeld. Thank you. Our title for tonight is Prayer in the Modern World, question mark. I don't know if you noticed that. Like, is it even possible? All right, we have a question. Question, and I'm sure I'm the only one who struggles with this, and everyone else's life is very happy, but... <laughs> How do you pray when you're mad or when you're angry and feel like it's falling on deaf ears? Thank you. Since Mary Rose is married, I'll let her take that question. <laughs> she, she has more experience. Yeah, I'm always happy. Because I mean, like, <laughs> God's always nice yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never been angry before. Um, I think that's a great question. You know, how do you pray when you're angry? And I, and I think it is similar to marriage because, you know, uh, I was uh, reading the Psalms, and, and there, you can read the Psalms, you know, the way that they sing them at Mass, or you can read the Psalms, some of them the way they really are, you know, basically, like, God, why did you do this to me? I'm so miserable, I'm so angry, I'm so upset. Like, if, if you go back and read the Psalms, King David was very blunt with God, and God said he is a man after his own heart. And, and I think just like in marriage, where if, you, if you're upset about something and you don't tell your spouse, then the relationship's going to suffer. And if you sit on things and stew on things, then they have no idea why you're upset. Now, God knows. He knows exactly what we're upset about. But he sees the big picture, and, and we don't. And uh, I, somewhere I had read this analogy of where, like, it's like a quilt or embroidery where we can only see underneath, and it's messy, and there's threads, and we have no idea what the pattern is, but God sees from the top. And, and if you're looking at it from the bottom, I, when I was five, I would crawl around under the table and my mom was quilting with all these ladies and I would just see you know, the hands moving. And I'm just looking, it looked like a zoo up there, you know? Um, but, but on the top, it was beautiful. Um, so I, I think that just part of the, it very, of course, very, very hard saying, you know, God, why? But, you know, even Jesus said, I think, uh, wouldn't you say, Father, that Jesus even said a few times, you know, kind of, Father, uh, you know, but, you know. Yeah, uh, Jeremiah, you know, you dupe me a lot, myself. I will speak your name no more. And I've said that a few times. <laughs> you know, but, 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 you, know you, you end up, uh, you, 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 out of necessity, you kind of, it comes out. But I think, uh, I think that's an important aspect. You have to pray as you can, not as you ought. Mm -hmm. And that's another big misconception. Prayer, mm -hmm. we think, you know, I'm not going to sing in public because it's supposed to sound a certain way. Uh, but, but prayer is real, and we've got to keep our prayer real. Mm -hmm. And I think to, to, to be upset and to, to be very frank with God, he can take it. He's, he's big. Job, you know, went on about 30 chapters complaining against God, and then finally, you know, he got a horse, and then <laughs> couldn't talk anymore, and then the good Lord said, you're done? And he said, well, let me ask you a few questions, you see. So as long as we give room for God to, to, to have a rebuttal, mm -hmm. I think it's uh, angry prayer is a good prayer. Uh, I think br Brother John Joseph, he's studying a little Hebrew, so he's into the scriptures a lot, and uh, so at the Bible study, 
he thought he would start with a psalm. So he said he pulled out his favorite psalm, Psalm 109, I think it was. And, and of course, as like Mary Rose said, uh, he pulled out the, uh, the uh, unabridged version <laughs> of Psalm 109. You know, and he like started praying. He was doing this publicly. <laughs> but it got really bad. It got worse and worse, you know, about, you know, it's a cursing psalm, you know. And, and, and uh, <laughs> the psalm was, you know, basically cursing all his, you know, uh, all his neighbors and everybody else. And, and, uh, and so the people were, like, shocked. But uh, so if you, need some, if you need some help with your anger, uh, you know, you just flip through the, the psalms. And there's plenty of psalms that would fit, uh, you know, fit well. It would be a good accompaniment for your prayer. The idea is, is don't, you know, don't scandalize the kids, you know, close the door and, you know, and, and then let God have it and then spend a little time to listen. But, uh, but angry prayer is good prayer. When people get angry at God because something happened in their life, this is very good. It's a good sign that they have a faith life because they're, they're angry. They, 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 that's the relationship. Mm-hmm. If you can get angry with somebody, that, that means you're in relationship with them. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's a good sign, uh, uh, anger. But we have to we have to be able to, uh, to to talk through it. And the good thing is God can take it. Mm-hmm. The spouse maybe can't, but, uh, <laughs> but God can. It's a great question. All right. Next. All right. I know we mentioned earlier about uh, technology sort of infringing in on our lives and uh, set, uh, certainly our prayer time, but. Can, uh, if it has, can, can you guys speak to, uh, has technology helped in your prayer life and mm-hmm. in what way? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. I think technology, I wouldn't say it has helped, but there are ways that you can find to sort of utilize it. And um, like I love some, you know, chant or praise and worship or, or sort of some music while working and you know mm-hmm. you only have so many CDs and but but on the internet you can find like oh well people who like this song like this song and you know Pandora starts to put together a playlist and some of these are just like oh, wow these beautiful songs like I never um, so you can really you know ha- you have access to beautiful prayerful music that you might not e- uh, otherwise ever have had you know and so I know for me that's been like sort of a, a newfound treasure um, and then uh, also you can set alarms on your phone, mm-hmm. you know, you can uh, make it, you can put it in nighttime mode. So like my phone is in nighttime mode from 8 p.m. till 7 a.m. I can't get calls or texts or email notifications or anything. It's like airplane mode, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you can set reminders throughout the day, you know, pray, pray. Um, there's a lot of apps, you know, pr- praise you go. And just there's so many things that if you do it the right way. Now, like I tried doing ma- my Magnificat, praying it on my phone, on the iPad versus paper, I can't pray off of my phone. I just can't. Like, I, I can listen to the music, I can do the reminders, like, I might read a reflection, but I can't pray off my phone. I've tried. Ryan can do it, no problem, but for me, that, that, that white light or whatever it is, like, it just messes me up. Like, I cannot uh, pray with that. Mm. Yeah, same. I, I mean, we're not, uh, and I'm in a religious community, so we're really not that tech savvy, but a couple of things that it has been uh, helpful technology is one is I have this time chimes uh, little software on the computer and it runs always uh, on the desktop and we have wired in uh, bells on the, on, the, on the campus so in my office so I have five minute warnings for all of our divine office so we have a five minute warning before 6 a.m. mass 5 a, you know, a, 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 a 515 wake up bell we have five minutes before all our scheduled prayers. Now, the help that that's been a big help for me is because I'm meeting with somebody, say, in spiritual direction in my office. And, and, and uh, so I get a five minute bell before the midday prayer, for example. And, and I'm in the middle of this, and I'll say, okay, well, they say, what's that, the bell? I say, well, that's, we have prayer in five minutes. I said, I'll tell you what, why don't we go and, uh, and, and do midday prayer, 15 minutes, and we'll come back and finish up. If it's something that I can't, I'm in the middle of a confession or I'm in the middle of something, I make that job, I just ignore it. And I say, okay, when I'm done here, I'll go do my prayer. But that's been very helpful because a lot of times I just get in to the, and I could stop the, what's going on or redirect it, but uh, so it's a reminder. It's like the setting the alarms. You got an iPhone, you can set the alarms at times for prayer. Three o'clock hours, somebody will have the chimes and the Divine Mercy chop it. But it's, it's just a reminder, even if you can't pray, uh, you know, even a deck of the rosary, but just a Hail Mary, you know, just uh, at the time, you know. 
so that can be very helpful, the, the, the uh, interspersing my day with a, with a certain amount of a bell ringing, the voice of God calling me to prayer. That's what the church bells was to call us to prayer. And so we have that on, on our campus. So anywhere on the property you can hear the bells electronically go off probably about 10 times a day, you know, the five-minute warning to start moving. And our thing is, you know, we have to be moving toward the chapel or in the chapel when the bell rings. It kind of, so we tried to... Uh, has helped us to build a consistency of regularity in, uh, in prayer. Great question. All right, next. Father, you had mentioned earlier that we should pray as we can, not as we ought. Mm -hmm. All of our emotions and distractions and our different attitudes that we're dealing with all day, every day, do those affect the effectiveness of our prayers? Well, I don't think so. I mean, distraction. I, I think St. Teresa of Avila, I think it's quoted in the Catechism, says uh, in, a, in, a, in an hour of prayer. Now, you may not have praying for an hour, but Teresa prayed for an hour. And it's good to know that they didn't have clocks or anything. They had an hourglass. And she would go and shake it because she could swear that, you know, the, the sand is, is getting, you know, the humidity is causing it to clog, and, and I've been here at least an hour, and, you know, this thing's defective. So she would go and shake the hourglass and hit it, you see, uh, and, you know, uh, to, to make time go by quickly. Uh, yeah, so she struggled. You know, they, they're just like us in many ways, you know. Uh, Mother Teresa would say the saints are just like us. The only difference is they made firm resolutions and stuck to them. But they're just like, they, they were bombarded with a thousand things. I go to Holy Hour, you know, and, and I've got all kinds of things. You know, I mean, we all kind of, we, 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 it's, it's just like you. I mean, I'm not that different than a lay person in, in, in sense of I still, when, when I became a priest, just from my ordination, the next day, my Holy Hour was different, my prayer was different. It's like, it'd be like uh, Mary and Joseph in the cave with baby Jesus, like, you know, two in the morning, and all of a sudden these shepherds come, then these Magi guys come, and then, you know, they got other people. And then it's like, you know, you're Fontanese, so you got 2,000 people. So it just gets crowded. And so I found my prayer got very crowded uh, with a lot of distractions. That doesn't make it less effective. Teresa Valdez says, if, if I am, if I am uh, it, it's a distraction that's keeping me from God, every time I become aware that, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm writing my homily for tomorrow. I'm, be, I'm here with Jesus, and I'm, 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 I'm writing my homily in my head. You say, what I want to preach on tomorrow. Um, well, I just back to you, Jesus. And if I do that a thousand times in an hour, what better way to spend an hour than a thousand times I love you, Jesus? You follow me? So I'm having, to, I'm having to consciously choose God over this kind of delectable thought here. You know, I'm playing basketball and dunking backwards or something. You know, you know some kind of you know, you're daydreaming or whatever. Uh, uh, you turn from that and you back to you, Jesus. Okay, so doing that is not, you're not going to enjoy that holy hour. You're not going to enjoy that prayer. It's going to be very distractive. I get up from prayer and say, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Now, what's my problem? I, I'm thinking that my quality of prayer depends on whether I'm peaceful, quiet, and I enjoy it. It'd be like going to visit mom in the nursing home, you know, and I go, oh, you're my favorite. You always come, Mike, and see me, you see. And, and you remember, mama, tell me when you and dad got, you know, and I enjoy visiting with mama. Then she's got Alzheimer's and stuff, and she's telling everybody, I don't go see her, you know, and she doesn't recognize. <laughs> then I don't, I don't enjoy it anymore. And so next thing you know, you talk to her, well, uh, she doesn't know who I am. I don't go. Well, shame on you. Is it about you or is it about mama? You, you know what I'm saying? Is it about uh, visiting mama? Is it about my experience of mama? Or is it about maybe mama's experience? So I think that's the thing that we have to turn to in prayer that, yeah, prayer is distractive, but it, it actually can, that can maybe help my prayer if I continually bounce off of them. Now, sometimes a distraction is an attachment. And so if I have a consistent distraction in prayer that keeps coming up and it prolongs, like my Harley Davidson. I just got a Harley Davidson, you know, and I'm like, I'm always saying about that Harley Davidson. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't, but suppose I, you say, well, then maybe I need to maybe, you know, get rid of the Harley Davidson, or maybe I need to, you know, maybe not, you know, be so focused. So sometimes I'm attached to something. And then sometimes it's something I need to take into my prayer. Mm -hmm. You see, I think it's a distraction, but the Lord's keep putting it in my face. You know, maybe it's my anger to my, a friend of mine, and he's saying, you know, why are you angry? Do you have reason to be angry? What are you going to do with this anger? 
So the distraction, I start to engage the distraction with the Lord. I talk, I talk to the distraction with the Lord, and that becomes very fruitful. Then I make a resolution. Okay, he wants me to go talk to Ralph, you know, and, and, and apologize, you see, for what went on and see if we can't work this out. And that becomes a very fruitful prayer instead of what I thought was, you see, a distraction in prayer. So you see there's some different elements of that. Right? All right. That, that was a great question, and I was enjoying yeah. it. <laughs> Next question. What are the advantages or disadvantages of, of a meditative prayer or constant prayer, like a rosary or a divine mercy chaplet? How helpful is that or not helpful is that in a prayer life? So the question is, um, so how are Divine Mercy Chapel to Rosary repetitive prayers helpful in, in establishing a prayer life? Um, I, I just speak personally on that one. For repetitive prayer has always been a huge struggle for me. Um, it, just, it just has been. Um, I like praying with scripture. Um, I, like, I like the quiet. Um, but for me, like, I would always be, what that came in on? Oh, shoot, where am I? Oh, what, what, what mystery am I meditating on? Oh, look, the rosary's broken. Somebody took three beads, you know. Um, it, it just... <laughs> um, the kids, I'm uh, sure. The kids, they yeah. Really took they, ate, they ate them or pulled them <laughs> off or I don't know what happened. But uh, so it, for me... It, it, was just, it was just always kind of a distraction, but um, uh, Ryan has always, that's really just been, like, that's just, you know, every family prays the rosary together. Well, of course they do, you know, and we, but we, we, we've kind of tried to sprinkle some throughout the day, like, you know, let's, Ryan would say, oh, for Lent, let's do a decade every night, you know, we can do this. Um, I know we, we have uh, four children with us and one in heaven, so I know when Ryan says the rosary, he says the first decade for our eldest, the next decade for our son, you know, and each kid has their decade of the rosary, and then, you know, pray for us, uh, the memorari at the end for our, for our marriage. So I think that has helped me because I'm like, okay, now we have an intention for this decade. So mm -hmm. um, not, like, I, I'm not going to forget that this decade's for Zaley, even though I might forget which mystery it is and where we are. Like, I'm praying with Mary uh, to Jesus for this child. And so that has helped. Um, and uh, I like the Divine Mercy Chaplet if it's sung, like if we're driving somewhere and it's in the car and, and listening and praying with it. Um, but uh, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say, I mean, personally, I'm going to let Father say, you know, wh which, whether one is, has more value. I think it's just kind of where you are and where God wants you to be. And, and you mm -hmm. know, I, I think it changes. Sure. Yeah, the beautiful about the church, we have a whole tradition of prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, prayer of praise, prayer of adoration, prayer of thanksgiving, you know, prayer of petition, prayer of intercession. So there's different, different and, and it's because it's a relationship, and there's, you know, there's different dimensions in how we express the relationship. So uh, I think that, that you know, there's different uh, kinds of seasoning, if you will, uh, and, um, and, and, and so we need to be familiar with the toolbox, if you will, that we have in our tradition of prayer. Catechism of the Catholic Church is beautiful in that, about speaking about the different varieties of prayer different forms of prayer. Um, and, and I think it's like a relationship. When you first, in a relationship, uh, words, are very fundamental. You speak to one another. Dialogue means I speak, you listen, and then you speak and I listen. That's a, that's a dialogue. Mother Teresa's definition of prayer. I speak, God listens, and then uh, God speaks and I listen. And that's a dialogue. And vocal, we use words, very fundamental uh, in a relationship. Uh, well, a lot of times the kids will talk at each other. You know, a lot of they're on the cell phones and they spend a lot of hours on the phone. But the relationship deepens and it gets inquisitive. So asking questions of one another. That's a, a form of prayer we call meditation, but pondering the scriptures, thinking, asking, talking to Jesus, wrestling with it, kind of sparring with, you know, with the Lord. So a question, and, then, and, then, and, and uh, that's important. And I always try to teach my directees, whether they're lay or religious, how to meditate. Uh, how to pond, how to take a text, think about it, and pray with the text, you see, a uh, scripture or imitation or something like that. And that, that's a very important prayer. Now, I'm at a scene of an accident. I mean, somebody, I stop on the side of the road, the ambulance is there, I go out there, somebody got hurt, whatever, and are uh, they dying? And, uh, well, let's meditate. <laughs> you know, let's pray in tongues or something, you know. No, our Father who art in heaven, how be thine. And you see, people can get, gather and pray. Uh, very, very important uh, prayer. 
Uh, so that's the different love. And then, and then just being with one another, just sitting like Eucharistic adoration. I look at him, he looks at me, just being there in the presence, sitting on the... That was old Father Fidelis' uh, definition. Fidelis, who had kind of brought the Christia down here, said, look, you go down the road on prayer room, you see the little shotgun shacks, you see a, and you got an old couple on the swing. He said, you see that they're swinging in the morning on that, on that swing? He said, what are they doing? He said, they're making love, you see? You see, that's, that's just being present to one another. You see, and that's a deep expression. They don't have to say anything, a deep expression. That could be silent prayer of adoration, we say contemplation, or just, just presence. So it, it, different forms of prayer for different times. Um, repetitive prayer is very important, uh, especially when um, some background music, when we're meditating on the scriptures. We should uh, uh, meditate. The rosary is like the gospel on, on beads. And if we're meditating, that's a powerful prayer. Um, it's very important when we're grieving, you see, and, and, some, and sometimes we can't even finish a Hail Mary, so I'll just say, you see, Jesus, 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 you see, or, you know, I, I believe, Lord, help my disbelief, I believe, Lord, help my, I'll take that little antiphon, Jesus, I trust in you, Jesus, I trust in you, Jesus, I trust in you. That repetitive calms me down, the movement of the fingers, there's a certain rhythm, it's a very, very uh, powerful prayer. I prayed the rosary every... I, I, I gave a... Con, uh, con, I was at a conference one time, and I, I told everybody, so I've been praying the rosary since I'm six months old. <laughs> then Father Russo got up and said, I've been praying since I'm two months old. <laughs> 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 Which is probably true, you know? <laughs> He's born with the rosary, you know? Uh, but, but, but my father made the cursia when I was six months old. He came back, like Fidel's told all the men, you go back, and as soon as you kiss your wife and tell the kids hello, you say, from this night on, we'll be saying the rosary in this house every night, you see? And that's what Dad did when I was six months old. And I, you know, my mom was, you know, he did probably didn't know what decades to, you know, how to say it. But, um, you know, he's praying it tonight on his, on his knees by himself. So it's possible, you know, but, but, but that's a repetitive prayer. But if we pray it properly, it, it creates a certain rhythm. And we tell people we love them, you know, I love you, I love you. They'll get tired of hearing that right. if it means, if, if it's meaningful. Um, and so I think that's what the rosary, the rosary and the Divine Mercy Chaplet can be very powerful to when we're stressed and we're grieving and to, to calm. It's a certain rhythm, but we have to, it has to be mental. We have to be thinking about what we're saying, about the words. We have to be putting the mind in union with the words. Because if I say, honey, I love you, and I'm not, <laughs> I don't care what those words mean, it's just words, then it's, it's doing harm rather than good. And sometimes repetitive prayer can be uh, obviously that. Uh, we go say the rosier en, en français. I say, what you? I say, whoa, man, I haven't even got through the first. <laughs> you know? So you wonder if they're just in contemplative union. And, uh, you know, but it, it can be an obstacle if we're not slowing down. And uh, that's what John Paul's favorite prayer was the rosary. Mm -hmm. uh, St. John Paul's favorite prayer, the rosary. But in his rosary letter, he told us how we should be praying. It'd be better to pray a deck of the rosary every night and, and pray it well than trying to heap up five or six rosaries or a, or a rosary, you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Mary Rose is saying. Yes. Is, is repetitive is good as long as it's, you see, meaningful. Great. Well, that's our last question for the evening. Um, we'll close with one more from me, which is, just to give a last word to, to us here, um, Lent is only so many weeks, but it's never too late to start a new practice, right? So for a lot of us, we've already had things added to our life for deeper prayer. Um, what would you say, each of you is closing comments to kind of encourage us in these last week of weeks, last weeks of Lent, uh, to pray and to make it as meaningful as it can be? We'll start with you, Mary Rose. Um, I, uh, I started Lent with uh, honestly not knowing what I was going to be doing for Lent, and, and every Lent it seems like there's kind of a theme, and God always chooses, and it's never me, and what I think it's supposed to be, it isn't, and so, you know, my mom always says, Did, you're giving up chocolate, right? You know, and I'm like, well, you know, I don't really eat that much chocolate, but now that it's Lent, I want some, but uh, uh, <laughs> don't really think about it the rest of the year, but, uh, I, you know, did all the giving up things and all that, but I realized that it, it, they're definitely like less phone, less noise. Um, but for Lent, my, my intention was to like to uh, actually like go hang out with people, not just on the phone, not just texting, not just emails, but to like set a time to, to, to be with people and 
uh, and even the kids, like the, Lent, the day before Lent started, uh, one of the kids said, Mommy, you never play with us anymore. And I was like, what do you mean? You know, like chase us, like, you know, <laughs> like, like really chase you, okay, you know, hide and seek, you know, rough house with us. I was like, okay. So, you know, first day of Lent, my, my, uh, my Lenten thing was, I, was, I played soccer with the kids, you know, because that's, that's and I realized like that, like, being in relationship with people, even if it's not super comfortable. On the, on the prayer side, uh, there was a book I had ordered a while back called uh, I Am, and then it's by Chris Stefanik, and you kind of fill in the blank, and it's, on the cover it says, like, I am loved, I am, you know, basically all these lines from scripture, but it's called I Am, Rewrite Your Name, Reroute Your Life. And it basically every single thing in scripture that God says we are, you know, I, you are chosen, you are mine, uh, all of these things. And there's a reflection every day on that with scripture passages, stories, super short, it's like a page and a half. Um, but it arrived like the first day of Lent in the mailbox, even though I'd ordered it forever ago because it was on pre-release. I was like, well, this is what I'm doing for Lent. And so uh, every, and all day long you reflect on whatever it was for that day, you know, to, you are beloved, you are chosen, you are, you are valuable, you know, whatever it is. And it's been very powerful. It's like every single lie that you've told yourself, God's like, oh, by the way, that's a lie. Um, and it's, it's, it's basically, this is what God says, and this is what the devil says. And um, you, you can just reorient yourself towards Christ by, by praying through scripture what God says you are, um, as opposed to kind of just all the negativity. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's been... Been wonderful. Great. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I might challenge you uh, to memorize a psalm. You got 150 of them. You can choose one. Uh, don't choose a curse in one unless, you, <laughs> unless you're really angry if you're angry. But, but I, I think we don't memorize enough. You know, we memorize a few prayers as kids, but, but memorize a psalm and then uh, and morning and evening, you know, recite it. And uh, then you can get in the habit of like before uh, uh, car, getting in the car, getting out of the car, choose, choose, a, choose like one of the Psalms like uh, 121 through 128, some of those Psalms of the Ascent, they're, they're very short, um, Psalm of hope, uh, so, unless the Lord build a house in vain does the build live it, one, Psalm 127. But take a Psalm during Lent and memorize it. And then, you know, in, in the morning when you rise, recite it, and you go to bed at night and you recite it. it it's very helpful when you're laying down in bed just to recite that, go to bed, you see, with, with the Word of God on your, in your mind. And that starts to pray. Because it, it strikes me, Mary, when, like her Magnificat, mm -hmm. when, when she got there, you know, and visited Elizabeth, and they, inter, they encounter, you know, and then she just breaks off and starts singing her Magnificat. Scripture scholars go through it and, and Luke, and they say, you know, obviously Luke, you know, who knew the Scriptures, was putting all this together and drawing from different sources. Yeah, no. Pope Benedict says, Never mind that. That's how Mary prayed. She, you see, she was so sautéed, you see, uh, <laughs> in, in, in prayer. She was so much that, with the scriptures, mm -hmm. that she was able to, she almost spoke the scriptures. And so uh, I think that would be one of the best things we could do to create a prayerfulness, is to memorize, you know, uh, something from scripture, like, like one of these psalms, and, and to recite that uh, during the Lent. And Jubilee of the Word is coming up in April, right? Right, Yeah, Father? yeah, Bible. And so you can sign up to be a reader in St. Martinville, reading the Bible from cover to cover. And uh, let's thank our guests for, for being with us tonight. All right.